Hey everyone, welcome to Church Online. Thanks for joining us. You know, tomorrow is Memorial Day. It's a day when we, as a country, pause, remember, and honor those who sacrificed their lives so that we, as Americans, could have the freedoms that we have. It reminds me of John 15, 13 that says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Because if you think about it, these soldiers didn't die for their own benefit. They laid down their lives for a greater purpose. They did it for us to, to give the people of our country collectively hope. And that is the hope of freedom. And as I was studying this week's passage, I was reminded of the greater purpose of our faith. The Apostle Paul stated it this way. It says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. According to Paul, the most important thing for you to know is Jesus Christ and why he died on the cross. That is our great purpose, to build our lives upon this purpose and help others do the same. And in the book of Mark, we see this is what Jesus taught his disciples. Continuing in chapter 9, picking up in verse 30, it says, They went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise." But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. Now remember, at this point, Jesus has come down from the Mount of Transfiguration. He found his disciples without understanding, power, and faith, but uses that opportunity to reveal to them and even to us how desperately we need him, that our lives do not work without him. And then they pass through Galilee, that's the region that Jesus grew up in, and once again he talks with his disciples about how he's going to die and rise again. And his disciples still don't get it. But notice how it says he didn't want anyone to know where he was at because he was teaching his disciples. Throughout the book of Mark, Jesus has often said things like, don't tell anyone who I am, don't tell them where I am, or don't tell them what I've done. And then we don't find out why, but here we get a reason. He wanted dedicated time to teach his disciples. And the sense is because what Jesus is teaching them is extremely important. And what was he teaching them? Well, it's the same thing Paul taught the Corinthians, that he was going to die on the cross and rise again. And why is this so important? Well, the answer is found in the response, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. Let's break down this statement so we can understand what Jesus is teaching. So first off, it says, the Son of Man, that's Jesus, is going to be killed by men. We humans will kill the perfect and innocent Son of God. And obviously, this is wrong. It's sin. It's evil. And this one action summarizes our biggest problem, that we are desperately sinful people. We wrong God and we wrong one another. Secondly, notice how it says that Jesus is going to be delivered into the hands of men to be killed. So who is delivering up Jesus? Well, a study of the original language may surprise you because it reveals that God the Father is the one delivering up his son to be killed. Finally, it finishes with, when he is killed, he will rise three days later. I believe the best way to explain this is to look to something else the Apostle Paul wrote. In 2 Corinthians, he says, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. 
When Jesus, the perfect and innocent Son of God, was delivered up to die on a cross, he was a sacrifice to pay for all of our sins. Our sins that rightfully deserve the eternal judgment of God. And that judgment was placed on Jesus as our substitute so that we could be forgiven and go free. It was God's plan to save the world. And the reason that we know it worked is because he did rise again. And why is the resurrection so significant? Well, Romans 6.23 says, For the wages or the consequence of sin is death. When you sin, the punishment is death. And since everyone dies, it proves we're all sinners. And when we die, the grave puts chains on you and it holds you there forever in its prison. But by Jesus' perfect substitutionary sacrifice, that sin was fully paid for. And because our sin that was placed on him is now paid for, death could not hold Jesus in the grave, which is why he rose again. And the good news, the gospel, is that this sacrificial payment is available to us. It can be applied to our life if we turn from our sin and put our faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And the reason why all of this happened is because God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's why Jesus died. That's why he laid down his life, because God loves us. And the love that birthed Jesus Christ and him crucified is the most important message in the world. It's the message that Jesus needed his disciples to learn during this dedicated time of teaching. But as the disciples will show us, it's easy for the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified to get lost in our lives. We quickly let other things become priority. Verse 33, and they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. What were the disciples focused on? Not Christ and him crucified, but which one of us is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? Hey, we can't blame them. We do this too, right? As Christians, we're supposed to be about Jesus Christ and him crucified, but too often we're about other things. And, 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 as, and as I'm thinking about this, there's this urge right now for me to maybe list a bunch of unhealthy things that I see happening in the church, things that have nothing to do with the gospel. But you know what? As, as I was thinking about it, throwing rocks at the temple of God, you know, and, and when I mean temple of God, I mean the church, throwing rocks at one another in the church isn't the answer to our problem. The answer is making sure we learn to prioritize the gospel, that we prioritize Jesus Christ and him crucified. And let me tell you, family, if you can get that right, it'll radically change your life. We must understand that true life isn't found in the pursuit of personal ambition, despite what our culture may tell us. And life isn't about being the greatest. Because what's the secret motivation behind the pursuit of greatness? Isn't it just the hope of separating ourselves from others? But Jesus didn't die so that we could separate. It's sin that separates us. Jesus died so that we could all be together as God's family. Verse 35, and he sat down and called the 12. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and a servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. You know, the idea of being a servant here is not the same as a slave. You know, a slave is forced to serve. The term here communicates a willingness to serve that's sourced from humility. And it's a sharing of God's character, of being part of his family, because God is a servant. 
and he is forced and obligated to no one, yet he chooses to serve because that's who he is. And he's also humble. He is exalted above all creation, but his heart is to be with his creation. And this is the kind of family that we are being invited back into. The kingdom of God is a family equally loved, valued, and serving one another. We are children fully dependent on our Father, not our own greatness, and simply desiring to be loved by one another. You know, I see glimpses of this beautiful kingdom reality in my own neighborhood. We live over in the condos, over at Milestone Commons, and, and there's a bunch of kids in our neighborhood. And, and, and though we would love to have a bigger house, maybe one with a yard, we also love the community there. You know, many of us are even family. In fact, Cade, my middle son, he says, Dad, I, I don't, I don't want to ever move. All my friends live here. And, and every day at 3.30 p.m., I experience that because four kids show up on my doorstep and then Cade disappears for three hours to go be with his family. That's the kingdom of God. And Jesus died for this so that we could be with him and one another. But we forget that. Like the disciple John, we say things like verse 38, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop it because he, he was not following us. You know, by nature, we practice separation in hopes of achieving greatness. But Jesus says, do not stop him. For no one who does a work in my name will be able to soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. When we take our focus off the greater purpose of Jesus Christ and him crucified, we forget that God is inviting people into his family. Therefore, when separation becomes our practice, that ain't Jesus. That's sin at work. John here didn't like the fact that someone from the outside uh, did something in Jesus' name. Why? By the way, let me just remind us that this unknown person accomplished something that the, the group of disciples had just recently failed at. The disciples failed at exercising a demon out of the desperate so, uh, father's son in the story previous. But why, why is John and the disciples upset now? Well, because of their sinful pride. They were like, hey, hey, you aren't authorized to do that because you're not one of us, special 12. Hey, check this out. How we treat one another is how we treat Jesus. How we understand relationships reveals our understanding of the cross. And here, John is pushing someone out of the kingdom of God, who Jesus clarifies belongs in the family. And here's a good practice for us Christians. Err on welcoming people into the family of God instead of practicing pushing people out. With that said, let me clarify. I'm not suggesting we welcome, accept, and even justify sin. Sin is a problem. Sin sent Jesus to the cross. Therefore, the church should not take sin lightly. Rather, we echo the heart of Jesus who told the woman who was caught in adultery, go and from now on, what? Sin no more. Additionally, let me clarify that I recognize there is an exclusivity to the cross. All people are welcomed at the cross but only those willing to put their faith in Christ are saved. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. However, Jesus desires everyone to be saved. And he paid the highest price to make that possible, which is why he says in verse 32, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. You know, another way to translate this is whoever causes someone willing to put their faith in me to feel like they don't belong in my family is in trouble. Why would they be in trouble? Well, because the cross is a big deal. 
And if Jesus died to welcome people in, who are we to push people out? When we inappropriately push people out, we dishonor the greater purpose of Christ and him crucified. You know, the book of Hebrews warns, how much worse the punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, has just dishonored him, and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and has outraged the Spirit of grace? Now, that's scary language here, but the principle is simple. It's basically telling us, do whatever it takes to live for Jesus, which includes inviting people into the kingdom of God by the message of the cross. And that basically summarizes what Jesus says next in verse 42. It says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into a sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands going to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two to be thrown into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Again, do whatever it takes to live for Jesus even if it's costly. But before we finish up, Let let me point something out that isn't the main purpose of what we just read, but is applicable. Here, Jesus talks about the reality of judgment, that those who die in their sin will face God's holy judgment, which results in eternal separation from God. And remember, the statement started off with, but if you cause one of these little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone hung around your neck. You know, I, I think I think it's acceptable to apply the passage this way. Whoever hurts children will face judgment. You know, this week we experienced a horrific tragedy. And it fell underneath the statement that I even made last week when I said that, you know, evil has no ethics. We saw that in Texas this week. And while we still have many questions about why this happened, one thing God promises and this passage confirms is that God sees it and he will judge it. No one gets away with any sin, especially those who harm children. The real question is, Who's paying for the sin? Because at the end of this life, there are only two options. Number one, you pay for your sin and face God's eternal judgment based on your own choices. Or number two, you repent, turn from your sin, and allow Jesus' payment on the cross to be applied to your life. And that's the important message that Jesus wanted his disciples to build their lives upon. He wanted them to let the gospel impact their personal life, but then also let it impact others, which is why in verse 49, he says, for everyone will be salted with fire. This is a confusing passage to understand, but one acceptable interpretation is that Jesus is saying, I need my people to be living sacrifices. My followers need to be on fire and dedicated to God and his mission and be ready to sacrifice so that others could know Christ in him crucified. Additionally, know that salt is a preservative. And likewise, Jesus sent his disciples and is sending his disciples and is sending us into the world to preserve it by seasoning our community with the message of the cross, the message of salvation. But if we're not doing that, if we're causing separation instead, we are missing our greater purpose. Mark 9.50 says salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Our purpose, our mission is to invite people back into God's family by way of the cross of Christ. And so as we close, uh, I, I hope that we get the importance of this. The cross of Christ is an invitation back into the family of God. And that's our mission. That's our message. And if we are doing or saying something else, it's revealing that our heart is out of sync with God's heart. 
And so where are you at today? Does Jesus Christ and him crucified define your life? Or have you accepted his sacrifice to pay for your sins? Or will you face judgment on your own? Because again, no one gets away with anything. Hebrews 9 says, and it's appointed for men to die once, and after that will come the judgment. You know, at the end, when God sees you, will he see your sin? Or will he see his son? Will you be welcomed into his family or will you choose outer darkness? Because let me assure you, God wants you in his family. He loves you. He sacrificed his only son to make this possible. And all you need to do is humble yourself, turn from your sin, and follow Jesus today. And for those of us who maybe already belong to God's family, you know what, let's stop making this life about ourselves. The kingdom of God is not about who will be the greatest. Jesus saved us for two primary reasons, to invite us back into his family and then to send us out to invite others in as well. You know, during Thursday uh, prayer this week, Pastor John read the following verse out of John 8. He said, and it says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. As you know, we live in dark times and people are experiencing hopelessness. But Jesus saved us so that no one has to walk in darkness. Therefore, let me encourage you, consider how you live. Live as light in the world. Live as the salt of the earth, helping people to leave the darkness and find hope in the light of Jesus Christ. And to do that, maybe you need to humble yourself and serve people, even if that adds nothing to your personal greatness. Or maybe you need to actively invite people into God's family. Or maybe you need to stop pushing people out of God's kingdom. You know, one way we can invite people into God's kingdom is through baptism. Now, let me explain. Here at the River Church, we practice what's called believer's baptism. What that means is that when someone makes a choice to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior, we baptize them. And that's different than what maybe some of you experienced when you were baptized as a baby in church. This, the believer's baptism, is telling the world, I have decided to follow Jesus. And as I go under the water, I know that I'm leaving my old sinful life behind. And as I come up, I'm identifying with my new life in Christ, that my sins have been paid for, and they're going to stay under the water. They're going to stay in the grave. And then one day, like Jesus, I too am going to rise unto eternal life. That's what, that's what baptism is about. Additionally, you know what? Baptism declares to the world, you're invited to. If God can save a sinner like me, he can save you too. And so let me ask, have you accepted what Jesus has done for you on the cross? And if so, do you need to obey Christ and be baptized? And if you need to be baptized, is this an opportunity for you to preach the gospel to those in your life by sharing or even inviting them to this baptism to celebrate with you? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you that you love us enough to send your son Jesus to die on it for us. And today we put our faith in you. Help us to build our lives upon your love. May we be people who are part of your family. May we be people who invite others into your family. And forgive us for our sins that have separated us from you and others from you as well. By your Spirit's power, transform us to be the light and salt of the earth that many would be saved in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us for Church Online. If this was your first time, fill out a Connect card. We would love to say hi to you, even send you a gift. Also, if you have any prayer requests, would like to know more about the River Church, or if today you have decided to follow Jesus and maybe even want to be baptized, we want to hear from you. There's an easy way to do that on our website, riverchurchct.com, or you can follow the links in the comments below, or you can text the keyword TRC Connect to 94000. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful day.
now you are. Now you are exalted to the highest place, King of the hands. For one day I'll bow, but for now, I marvel at this saving grace. I'm full of praise once again. Oh, I'm full of praise. that again. Once again, I pour out my love.